May y'all bow your heads. Dear Lord, yesterday we worshiped with joyful hearts and gratitude for the gift to your son Jesus, for his life, death, and his resurrection, for the forgiveness of sins, for hope, and the promise of eternal life. We are so thankful for this gift you have so graciously given to us. At the same time, our hearts are heavy of the tragic attacks at churches and hotels in Sri Lanka on the day of Easter worship. Our hearts and prayers go out to these people and families of Sri Lanka. <clears throat> May the world reach out to comfort them and to face the hatred in this world around us. We pray, pray for the perpetrators, for their hearts to turn from hatred and to embrace compassion and love for others. As Rotarians, may we be given the same mind that was in Jesus Christ, that sharing in his humility, we may do what is right in our work, in our communities, and to others worldwide. Please bless this food we are about to receive and for the nourishment of our bodies and for us to thy service. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Becky. Everybody to take their seats. Um, Josh Hart is offering fellowship today, and he's on his way up to introduce visiting Rotarians and guests. And uh... good afternoon. Uh, we have two visiting Rotarians from the Five Points Club: uh, Emerson Smith and Kathy Smith. And I'm so excited to introduce to you Sid Kenyon, who is the general manager of the Columbia Life Arena. And he's an amazing man in his own right. And he also just happens to be the husband of our, our new Rotarian, Lynn Kenyon. Hi, I'm Jerry Bright. Today I'm pleased to have with me Brucey Alexander told me once, if Cindy ever speaks, she wants to come, so here she is. I'm Kay Shaw, and my guest today is Kate Abdullah. Kate is a lawyer with Parker Poe. Please welcome Kate. second visit to our club, a longtime friend of mine, Tom McDonald. Tom is a Columbia native, a uh, drear high guy, but he got educated at the University of California, but he's back, been back for a long time. He's in warehouse management, so. I'm Stephen Creech. Is uh, Graham Schmidt still in the audience? Graham? Right? Just here a Anyway, uh, Graham Schmidt is here today. He had to step out momentarily. He is the owner of Prince George uh, Transport, and he is a guest of the club, and that is a private ambulance service. So welcome, Graham, as well. My guest today is my friend and co-worker, Brad Worthen. Many of you will remember Brad. Brad was the, um, I don't know if I'm going to get the title right, but the uh, executive editorial director of the state newspaper for many years. I'm close to Todd, a good friend of Cindy Scoppy. They worked together for many years. So this is a treat, I think, for Brad to be with us and a treat for us to have Brad here. Brad's a former Rotarian, so let's give him a good morning. Any other guests? I would like to uh, take this time to introduce our assistant district governor, Eric Davis, who's a past uh, member of this club and San Diego. It's my deep pleasure and high honor to introduce, uh, I'm Gene Rogers, to introduce my wife, Elsie Rass Stewart. When we got married, she let me keep my maiden name. <laughs> Yes, 
next to us. He uh, just was able to get here. He was our speaker a couple months ago. Elliot Daniels, standing in the back. He is assistant U.S. attorney and uh, here with us today as a visitor. Welcome. Great to have such a big crowd today, uh, the day after Easter. I know everybody's clearing some cobwebs. We certainly are in my household. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, mention the cart buckets that are sitting on your table. Please remember to give to those. Um, our just, just was announced this morning that uh, we hit our district goal of $250,000 for the cart fund. So please don't check it out. just received in the mail some uh, QR codes that we're going to adhere to the side of the cart bucket. So for those of you who don't have cash and want to uh, scan the code, it will take you right to the cart website. If you would like to give electronically, you can do that as well. So uh, improvements coming every day here at the Columbia Rotary Club. Um, I saw Rex Wilson walk in. I'd like to invite him up to the podium to offer our health and happiness. That's the closest I've been to running since back in June. <laughs> Some of you don't know I had back surgery and it worked. All right, now, I'm just a little over 6'2", so I'm going to have to adjust this. <laughs> I don't appear that tall because I'm so well built, broad shoulders and all that. But most people think I'm about 5'9", but I'm actually 6'2". Um, I want to start off with uh, sharing with you that uh, Ruth Siegler is home now and recovering and appreciates your thoughts and prayers. A gentle, fine man was getting ready for bed when he noticed his wife was looking at herself in the mirror. My wife never does that. Her birthday was coming up, so he asked her what what she'd like to have for her birthday. I'd like to be eight again, she replied, still looking in the mirror. On the morning of her birthday, he got up early, made her a big bowl of cocoa pots. He took her to Adventure World theme park. Oh, what a day, every ride in the park. They did the death slide, the wall of fear, the screaming roller coaster, everything they had in the park. Five hours later, they staggered out of the park. Her head was reeling. Her stomach felt like it was upside down. He took her to McDonald's for a Happy Meal with extra fries and a chocolate shake. And then they were off to a Disney movie with buttered popcorn, a great knee-high soda, and her favorite, a giant Tootsie Roll. Oh, what a fabulous adventure they had. Finally, they wobbled home, she hanging on to his arm, and collapsed into the bed, exhausted. He leaned over his wife with a big smile and lovingly asked, Well, dear, what was it like being eight again? Her eyes opened very slowly expression changed. I meant my dress size, you idiot. <laughs> it was too long and I didn't know how to it. There's a moral to that story. Even when a man is listening, he's still not going to get it right. <laughs> wisdom and she hangs it in our den I dusted once it came back and I'm not falling for that again <laughs> I thought that was cute anyway the guy took his girlfriend to the Super Bowl and after the game he said how'd you like it oh I really liked it she replied especially those tight pants and those big muscles but I just couldn't understand why they were killing each other over 25 cents. My boyfriend asked, what do you mean? Well, they flipped a coin, one team got it, and the rest of the game, all they kept screaming was, get the quarterback, get the 
quarterback. <laughs> she said, I'm like, hello, it's only 25 cents. <laughs> in the morning. There was a loud pounding on the door and the man got up and went to the door and there was a drunken stranger standing in the pouring rain and asking for a push. Not a chance, said the husband. You know it's three o'clock in the morning. He slammed the door and went back to bed. His wife said, well, who was that? He said, just some drunk guy asking for a push. Did you help him? No, I did not. It's three in the morning. It's pouring down rain out there. Well, you have a short memory, she said. Can't you remember a few months ago when we broke down and those two guys helped us out? I think you should help him. You should be ashamed of yourself. You know, God loves drunk people too. I can attest to that. <laughs> the man does as he told and gets dressed and goes out into the pounding rain. He calls out in the dark. Hello, are you still there? Yes. You still need a push? Yes, please. Where are you? Over here on the swing. <laughs> Think about it. Two elderly gentlemen were sitting on a bench under a shade tree and one said, Oh, Slim, now that I'm 87 years old, I'm full of aches and pains. We're about the same age. How do you feel? Lim said, well, I feel just like a newborn baby. Really? Yep. No hair, no teeth, and I think I just wet my pants. <laughs> I took the names out to protect myself and my friend. Another man was telling his neighbor, I just bought a new hearing aid. Oh, it cost $4,000, but it was worth it. You know, it's state of the art. Just perfect. Really? What kind is it? 12.30. I think I'm going to skip to the last one because this one's good and I don't want you over here. I always get a cheer when I say I'm skipping one. A German Shepherd, a Doberman, and a cat die. The three are faced with God who wants to know what they believe in. German Shepherd said, I believe in discipline, training, and loyalty to my master. Good, says God, you may sit on my right side. The Doberman, he asked, what do you believe in? The Doberman answers, I believe in the love, care, and protection of my master. Aha, you may sit to my left. And he looks at the cat and he asks, and what do you believe in? And the cat answers, I believe you're sitting in my seat. <laughs> Great job, Rex. Thank you. Thank you. Some humor and making us all laugh. Um, past President Michael Kahn is here today. We've got a, a special presentation. We're going to be inducting two new members. Thank you, Brother Stephen. I'd like to invite to the dais two special guests of Columbia Rotary, along with their sponsors. And if you would turn and face the club, that's Lynn Kenyon, sponsored by Lee Lumpkin, and Kishore Pokarn, sponsored by Stephen Creech. This is a very interesting pair of inductees, and I know you want to remember their names. What I tell you his name was? <laughs> uh -huh. oh, pretty good. We're going to work on that in a minute. Um, so as I uh, introduce each of you, if you just take a step forward so they can recognize you. Lynn Kenyon first. Lynn is an account executive with VC3. This is an IT management service and consulting firm in Columbia. <laughs> what does that mean? VC3 can either provide information technology and support for your staff, or they can be the staff for your IT. And uh, Lynn herself is in charge of the South Carolina business development for her firm. And she and her husband, Sid, who was introduced to you, who is the general manager for the Colonial Arena, they live at Nine Fox Glove Court. This is right on the edge of Harbison State Forest in Irmo. And the map, 
actually shows that they are part of Harborson Forest, State Forest. So I asked her if by being ensconced in the forest, do they can they avoid property tax? And she said, no, they get hit by both the city and the county. <laughs> so no, no relief. Lynn, a Columbia College grad in English Communicative Arts and Business Admin, enjoyed a stint with the Five Points Rotary Club around the turn of the millennium. And she's most interested in reactivating one with the Columbia Club because of the opportunities to give back to her community. Some examples of Lynn Kenyon's other community involvement include volunteering with the FBI Citizens Academy. Did you know there was such a thing? Serving as a CPR instructor. So you want to sit at her table. We've got some folks that are so all old, you'll probably be having to be called on to do some resuscitation. And she uh, also has helped out with the Associate Heart Association. In addition, she has led some boards uh, such as Crime Stoppers, Columbia Cas uh, Classical Ballet, Lee, and multiple cancer-related organizations. A self-described voracious reader, some of her, some of the favorites for both Lynn and Sid are books by the author Stephen King, whom Lynn describes as a writer of beautiful prose, not the typical suspense that you might be thinking. Beautiful prose who explores good versus evil. When Lynn's not exploring the literary landscape, she and Sid like to travel the real world. Lynn enjoys all genres of life, of live entertainment, and anything that remotely resembles Gamecock. Lynn and Sid have two grown boys, Aaron and Zach. Lynn, we welcome you to Columbia Rotary Club. And now meet Kishore. And I'm going to help you with his name by sharing this little handle that he gave me. If you take a key to your car, take a key, and you take the shore to the lake, you have key shore. Right? Remember that, key shore. Now, for you overachievers that would like to learn his last name as well, you can remember Pocahana because it sounds like Pocahontas, right? Pocahontas. Imagine Pocahontas sitting up there on his shoulder. Pocahontas. Got that key shore? Pocahana. Very good. Now, I, I wish that Lester Bates, who was fond of butchering names, that these things were here today. He would, he would really love introducing Kishore. So, did y'all hear the one about the attorney, the accountant, the jeweler, and the photographer who went into the bar? Did y'all get all that? Attorney, accountant, jeweler, photographer. Now, if all these diverse characters were a single person, the joke might be about Kishore. Seriously, he was educated in Indian universities and in law, where he had his own practice. And he also picked up accounting and jewelry. He now owns a family diamond business, Global Diamonds, and photography skills when he moved to the U.S. in the late 80s. Married to Ray New, who was on the USC Neuro science faculty. Kishore is a fascinating person to talk with. You want to share a rotary table with Kishore and ask more, for example, about his previous service in the uh, downtown Pittsburgh club, um, where he organized a peace rally after a devastating community shooting. Or ask him about his interest in Indian and other cultures or about the education of young people being the key to peace. Wind him up and I tell you, Kishore can talk. <laughs> for fun, and Kishore does count photography, by the way, as fun more so than a professional interest. He enjoys cooking, lifelong learning, and traveling. Although I must add that he doesn't travel as he did in college, where he was a hang gliding instructor. I'm not making this up. How often do we get hang gliding instructors in Rotary? A man who loves life and can share a story, Kishore Pokarna. And now, could I ask the candidates and their sponsors to face me as soon as the pinning is done? There we go. Face me and uh, Lynn Kishore. Uh, you probably recall from your previous Rotary service that these pins are great conversation openers. And 
the recognized worldwide. In fact, you can order some additional pins through Russell Hampton online, and you can put one on all, each one of your suits. Done. We welcome you to Rotary International, to the Columbia Club in particular. You're joining a force of 1.2 million Rotarians. What does that mean? One point, we throw these numbers around. If you could imagine <coughs> this banner behind you, behind me, laid flat, and stacked up 1.2 billion times. How tall would that be in comparison with, say, the tallest building in the world? Half as tall, three quarters as tall? 1.2 million of these laid flat and stacked up would be six times the tallest building in the world. That's a lot of Rotarians. Those are now your friends and colleagues, and they're all working on things that interest you, peace, world understanding, projects as big as resolving uh, polio, for example, or as personal and direct as uh, alleviating hunger right here in the Midlands. <clears throat> Some of Columbia's uh, most well-known leaders are parts of this club, and in fact, that's why your talents have been recognized and why you're here. On your road to coming to this point, you've uh, been a Rotarian before, you know a lot about it from previous experience. You've had a sponsor that is taking you under his or her wing. Uh, you've had a conversation with the past president, and hopefully you've paid your dues. And if you have, then you are now part of one of the most well-respected and uh, organizations that you love to be associated with. Welcome to Rotary. Glad to have you in the club, and uh, very nice, very nice job there. Appreciate that. Um, one update for me, uh, Cynthia is going to pull up a slide, um, is about the bocce bash, which is coming up when Saturday. this Saturday. So uh, this is uh, the end of the year, or the final quarter for me, and I will be a lame duck president uh, come Sunday, especially if we have good weather on Saturday. I wanted to uh, educate you on a few things to know if you're planning to come out there and, and join us on, set, on Saturday, which I hope that you are. Um, let's see if I can read this from here. So, uh, kicks off Saturday morning, and the gates open at 8 o'clock, but we won't start rolling. The competition won't start until uh, 9.30. Um, lunch, beer, water will be provided. There will also be other concessions open, so if you... Uh, some french fries or whatever the fireflies have in their concessions you're, you're welcome to do that as well uh, just skipped Sorry. thank you um, t-shirts and a swag bag will be provided for everyone who's a contestant uh, but spectators are welcome so if your plans have, have cleared up and you are now available to just drop by for an hour or a couple hours uh, you're certainly welcome to come out there for free if you want to uh, buy lunch you can do that too or if you want to participate in the all you can drink beer you can do that too for a very, very reasonable price. So please come out and, uh, and support the club's fundraiser. Um, encouraged to bring tailgating chairs and, uh, and a tailgating tent. So um, we're gonna be set up, the tents will be set up all along the uh, warning track at the Firefly Stadium, Segra Park. So please bring a tent just to get out of the sun. The, uh, the mezzanine area, I always call it the wrong thing. But it, it's a, available too, you know, there'll be bathrooms and you, you can escape the sun if necessary, but if you don't want to walk so far to escape the sun, please feel free to bring a tent and some chairs uh, to give yourself some relief. And, uh, and lastly, uh, you may want to bring some sunscreen because somebody told me the forecast was looking good. I've been too scared to look at the forecast all week <laughs> or for months now, so uh, I'm not even going to look at it. But uh, bring some sunscreen, but no, no, spray, no spray sunscreen, excuse me, is allowed on the field. And that's just a rule of the uh, Fireflies organization. They, they've got a beautiful park out there. Uh, they take good care of that field, so we just want to honor that. So um, anyway, any questions about the Bocce Bash? Elliot. Are you giving the winning to charity? Are you giving them back to the club? Because I have a feeling you're going to win the whole thing. That's a, no, well, actually, I'm, right now I'm not, I'm not even playing. I'm going to be, vol I'm going to be volunteering. Um, we've, we've fortunately filled our volunteer spots. We have 52 teams that have been sold. And over forty thousand dollars already in the bank. So this is really been a success. Thanks to so many of you who have, uh, who have volunteered your time and your resources to make that happen. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce John Monk, who's going to introduce our speaker. I'm 
not as tall as Rex, so I'm going to lower this. <laughs> Our speaker today, Cindy Ross Scoppy, editorial writer and columnist with the Charleston Post and Courier, she's based here at Columbia, needs very little introduction. And um, I'm going to summarize her life very quickly because we all need to know what makes our speakers tick. Cindy was uh, brought up on a tobacco farm in a religious family in North Carolina, and she continues today to have a very active religious life in one of our local Episcopal churches. And at a very early age, she became fascinated with words in elementary school, and later on in school, she uh, was on this student newspaper, and she realized what a wonderful way to meet people and go talk to anybody, anywhere, about anything. And in college at the University of North Carolina, she majored in journalism and in political science. And uh, after she graduated, she spent a year at the Fayetteville Observer in North Carolina, home of Fort Bragg where I went through basic training long ago, and uh, came to the state where she spent the first 11 or 12 years as a police reporter, county, county government record, reporter, federal courts reporter, and also covering the legislature. And in 1998, she became an editorial writer. And her experience as a reporter down in the trenches as we say, allowed her to become familiar with the people, the personalities, the power, the citizens groups, the lobbyists, all the dynamics that go into shaping law and public policy and social norms in our city, state, and country. So that's what she brought to the editorial board. A lot of, a lot of experience. She's no armchair journalist. And once on the editorial board, she started to win, or continue to win, all kinds of awards, including South Carolina Journalist of the Year, which is usually given to reporters, but she won it as an editorial writer. And uh, she got a lot of other awards, including some from the American Civil Liberties Union and Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and just too many to mention. She's uh, now uh, with the Charleston Post and Courier, having left the state last year, and that's the uh, Post and Courier's gain and our loss. But that's the way life is sometimes. So without further ado, I'm going to let's turn the microphone over to Cindy. Thank you. Thank you, John, for those kind words. Um, thank you for, to all of you for being here. Thank you for the invitation, Louisa. Um, I've been having the conversation. I've been having the same conversation. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Okay. I've been having the same conversation over and over a lot for the past seven months. I'll, whenever I run into someone I haven't seen in a while, or I meet someone new, it'll go something like this. Oh, I miss your column so much. And then, so what are you doing now? And then, um, I don't think the state newspaper is going to survive. Or some questioned version of that statement, like um, what's going to happen to the state? Um, are newspapers going to survive? And in the past few weeks, um, it's sort of morphed a little bit into, so why is the Post and Courier growing while the state shrinking? I'm going to take a giant leap here and assume that that's the way the conversation with a lot of you would go. And so let me just start with that last question because it's the most straightforward. The Post and Courier is family owned and the state newspaper is owned by the McClatchy Corporation. That's probably all the explanation that a lot of you need, but let me elaborate just a little bit. I want to start by saying not just because I signed a severance agreement, but because I believe this. There's nothing bad about the McClatchy Corporation. Um, but it's a publicly traded company. And as such, it has an obligation to its shareholders to maximize its value. 
It also owns a whole lot of other newspapers, um, many of which have not traditionally been as profitable as the state has been. The state doesn't get to decide um, how much of its revenue it spends on the newspaper. Like any subsidiary, it's the corporation that makes those determinations. And as newspapers have had a tougher and tougher time competing against social media and other online publications, the amount of money that the, new, the state newspaper has been able to um, spend on newsprint and reporters and editors has declined. By contrast, the Manigo family in Charleston has retained ownership of the Post and Courier. Pierre Manigo, whose great-grandfather author purchased the Charleston Courier in 1896, is now the chairman of the board of Post Industry, of, excuse me, Evening Post Industries. There are two things you need to know about Evening Post Industries. The first is that it's incredibly diversified. In addition to newspapers, it owns hospices and specialty pharmaceutical companies and online, um, I'm sorry, marketing companies and timberland and real estate. What this means is that it doesn't have to rely on the newspaper to make a profit. The second thing is that the Manigo family is committed to public service journalism. When I applied for the job I have now, the last step of the process was to meet with Mr. Manigo. And as we were discussing our values and our visions, I remember thinking, you know, even if I don't get this job, I am just so gratified to have the opportunity to talk with someone who has the values that this man has and who has the, um, the ability to turn them into reality. It probably won't surprise any of you to hear that the Post and Courier is working very hard to become your statewide newspaper. And that is good news for all of us. You know what will be even better news for all of us? If the state newspaper is also able to survive and thrive. Because the more reporters we have covering our state, the better informed we're going to be about everything important that's happening in our state and the better able we're going to be to participate in this experiment in representative democracy. <clears throat> Newspapers are going through a tough time for several reasons. Reasons that involve changes in our economy and in our society and in information delivery systems and in politics. One big thing that newspapers have to do, and this breaks my heart, but it's the reality, is we have to make the conversion from print to online so that we'll be able at some point to eliminate what are called legacy costs. That is printing a newspaper every day and delivering it to your driveway. We've been working on this for a couple of decades now and I used to be 100% confident that all newspapers were going to make this transition. I am no longer confident of that, although I do remain optimistic. The public's changed. Um, we are less interested in actual facts than we used to be, particularly when those actual facts aren't the things we want to hear. There's also a concerted campaign to undermine the credibility of newspapers and of journalism in general. It's being waged by people who not only have a political interest, but also a financial stake in doing this. Um, and they've been helped by, um, by people who blur the lines between fact and opinion, who show complete disregard for the facts, and, and yes, by people in our industry who aren't as careful as they ought to be about controlling their biases. This blurring goes back at least to the advent of the 24-hour news channels on TV. Um, what the owners of those channels channels quickly realized was it cost a lot of money to hire enough reporters and videographers and support to provide news 24 hours a day. It doesn't cost a lot of money to bring in a bunch of people who want to spout their opinions. And the more channels and the more time slots there are, the more of those people you need. The more provocative people are, the better ratings they're going to get. And you know, it's very difficult to fact check 
people, particularly on a live program like that. And you know, it's just opinion, so why bother, right? This is where I want to take just a short detour and talk a little bit about opinions, since that's what I do. Um, <laughs> you know what they say about every one of us having an opinion. Well, that is absolutely true when it comes to uninformed opinion. It is not true when it comes to informed opinion, to opinion that is um, that starts out with fact and is built around those facts. You and I can come to entirely different opinions um, based on the same set of facts, and that is perfectly okay. What's not okay is when we come to different opinions because one of us starts out with the facts and the other one starts out believing whatever she wants to believe and thinking that's the fact. And that's where we are today. At their best, newspapers give us the actual facts that we can then use to come to our different or similar opinions. You want to know how you can make sure newspapers survive? Okay, it sounds easy and obvious, read them. But not the way you've always read them. Who still reads the print edition of your newspaper? Please stop. <laughs> or at least don't do that exclusively. If you want to save newspapers, if you want to save the people like John who write for newspapers, please read the articles online. And don't read the e-edition. Go to the website and read their articles now, um, there. If you subscribe to the state or to the Post and Courier, you're already paying to read the information online. Please do that. Here's why. When I was at the state, I always kept a browser window open um, with a, a program that would tell me at any moment of the day or night precisely how many people were reading which column of mine at that moment. It would tell me whether those people were here in Columbia or somewhere else in South Carolina, somewhere else in the country, in London, in Montreal, in Paris. It would tell me all of that. It would tell me on average how long people were reading each column. We value what we can count. You cannot count the number of people who read an individual item in the print newspaper. You cannot count the number of people who read an individual item in the e-edition. So a lot of newspapers just pretend that those people do not exist. If you raised your hand a moment ago, most newspapers do not care about you. Once you measure something, it becomes a commodity, which can be given a value. So now writers can be given monthly quotas for readership. I'm truly blessed that the Post and Courier is not into these numbers the way most newspapers are, and I, I say this because I feel blessed, but also I want you to know I'm not speaking to help myself here. Um, although, you know, these numbers have value, and they're only going to become more valuable over time, and eventually all newspapers are going to have to take them more seriously, even, even though we don't want to. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about um, how counting clicks degrades the quality of journalism, about how it teaches writers to write headlines that are more provocative than they ought to be, and therefore that it come close to or even cross the line into looking like bias, and in the process undermine their own credibility. We could talk about how writers learn to write the, um, the content that people want to read at the expense of what they need to read. But that's not my point. My point here today is simply to tell you that this is happening so that you understand that. And to urge you to give the writers whom you respect the clicks they need to be able to continue to do their jobs and to do serious journalism. Now, I know it's a little audacious of me to suggest 
that you can take individual actions to save an entire industry or even one newspaper or one reporter. So here's another question for you. How many of you vote? And you vote because? Well, because you believe that your individual action, when combined with the individual action of your neighbors, can make a positive difference in your community. The same thing is true with reading your newspapers online. There are a lot of other ways that individual actions um, can add up to make significant societal changes. So hold on now because I am about to take this conversation in a whole different direction that y'all weren't expecting. I want to talk for a few minutes before I finish about public education. Um, I want to spend some time on this for two reasons. One is because the same principle that I'm talking about can be applied to public education. Also, um, one of the things that I came to recognize during my involuntary sabbatical was that the most important thing that I could do, that I wanted to do, was trying to move the needle on education in South Carolina. Um, I've written a lot over the years about how we can't afford to throw away any of the kids in our state, no matter how lousy a job their parents are doing, supporting them. We have to save them because if they don't get a decent education, they're going to become a drag on our society. They're going to receive um, public assistance that we're going to have to pay for or they're going to become criminals and we're going to have to pay for more police to protect ourselves from them and for more prisons to lock them up and the staff. We might even become their direct victims. There are big things that we can do to improve our schools. We can make it more attractive for the best and the brightest to become teachers. We can make it easier to get rid of that tiny minority of teachers who do not belong in the profession. We can make sure we've got the best curriculum for those teachers to teach and the most supportive and uh, the most supportive principles they can have. We can make sure that those principals have supportive um, and wise superintendents. We can make sure that those superintendents have good school boards that they work to, that they work for. And we have to do all that. And for a lot of kids, if we just do that, they're going to be fine. But there's a lot of kids who won't be just fine. They're the kids who start off behind and get farther behind every day. Most of them come from poor families. They have parents who don't value education. <coughs> and either won't or simply can't give them the support they need to do well in school. When these kids walk through those school doors for the first time, they don't know how to count. They don't even know the names of colors. They have no concept of the fact that they need to know any of these things. They have no concept of the idea that they are supposed to do what their teachers tell them to do. We have got to get them caught up. We have got to get to the, them to a point where they start out as the same level of our kids. We've got to figure out how to inspire them so they want to learn. And that's going to work differently with every one of them individually. This past fall I met a woman named Georgia Miarden. Georgia runs First Steps and she is absolutely inspirational. What struck me about Georgia was how excited she gets about tiny little programs in some of the county <coughs> First Steps offices that are helping just a handful of kids. She gets excited because she understands that the way we fix this big problem is one child at a time. She understands that the way we make sure every child in our state gets the education he or she needs to succeed is to start early and to work individually with every one of those children. 
It's to work individually with the parents of every one of those children who need that extra help. George's excitement is tempered by realism. First steps is timing. And just like our schools and our banks and our utilities and our car repair shops and yes, our newspapers, some of the first step, steps programs are doing a fabulous job. Others are worse than a waste of money. And just like our public schools, we have to figure out how to make the first steps programs that are doing an awful job do a fabulous job. And we have to figure out how to help them reach more kids. And then when they come to school, we have to continue giving them the extra support that they need the best teachers instead of the worst ones, mentors, after-school programs, year-round programs. It's not going to be easy because there's, there's no clear results yet as to precisely how to do this in the best way. It's not going to be cheap because all of that extra means extra teaching time and we have to pay for that. This means it's not going to be politically popular, but it's something that we can do and it's something that we must do. And the only way we're going to do this is if every one of us, every one of us acting individually helps our lawmakers to make the right decisions. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you have.
focus on presenting the facts and you know, checking their facts before they're reported. But what I'm seeing in addition to that now is selective facts to steer the conversation. So rather than telling the whole story, they'll tell the facts that push their agenda. They can still claim that what they are saying is factual. Is that, a, is that something that's taught in journalism school, or is that something that just happens once you leave? I, I can't speak to what's taught in journalism school today. I, I would offer a couple of thoughts about that. One, journalism has always been about selecting which facts to tell because if you're a decent reporter, you've got ten times as much information as you have space to convey it. Um, I know that there are exceptions out there and that there are probably more exceptions at the national level. The reporters I do, that, that I know, um, their agenda, well right now their agenda is let me write something that people will read so that I can keep my job. Um, their, their agenda behind, besides that, I think is primarily to try to keep people informed. So it's easy, it's human nature for all of us when we see something we don't like and we know that this fact was left out to think there's a political reason for it. What we might not realize is that this fact was left out too and this one and this one. Again, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying that it might not happen as much as you believe it does. Yes. Sandy, uh, a little bit earlier your remarks you talked about how the headline might be written on the college. And I just noticed that it's kind of struck hard whether you're watching television or whether you are looking on the internet or looking at a printed page. It's um, something like dog calls three-year-old child. And you're thinking, Gosh, I wonder who, who I know them. And, and it happened in Seattle, Washington. Exactly. But, what's that doing on my news? What's that doing in my room? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that's a really good question. I'm not sure what to say except to agree with you. Um, you know, the, the newspapers, I think, try to primarily focus, and their staffs primarily focus on things that are going on here, but the papers are getting feeds in all the time. I know at the state, I think Associated Press comment content just feeds automatically in with, with onto the website with whatever headlines, with everything, and that's from across the country. So, yes? Sandy, on education, mm -hmm. we've reached the tipping point where child wedlock pregnancies are removed. We see lots of headlines and stories in churches celebrate single parent. And we hear men's groups promoting fatherhood initiatives. But we don't hear much about don't get pregnant out of wedlock. We have, has the culture shifted so much that we're just kind of living with this? I don't know what those men. Yeah. isn't doing anything, isn't saying anything about it. This part is because, what do you say? I mean, my church and other churches care very deeply about this. You can't pass laws to stop people from doing this, though. And so again, what we have to focus on is, those children are here, they're in our state. We have an obligation to ourselves, if not to them, to make sure they get educated.
Cindy, thank you so much for coming today. I know everybody in this room is excited to see you on our on our list. And uh, the coin I just gave you has a, a picture of Paul Harris on one side and a, a copy of the Rotary Four Way Test on the other, which uh, you'll you'll find uh, uh, familiar to your ethics and journalism. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, next week we are having a naturalization ceremony, and Judge Joe Anderson, our very own, is going to conduct that for us. So that's going to be exciting. I hope to see all of you Saturday at the Bocce Bash, and with that, we will stand and close in song.